What? Yeah, that'd be the first step. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome all to the uh, March 2nd, 2021 meeting of the Growth Planning Committee. And we'll start off with the introductions of uh, the members and guests. I'm Dan Saunders. Jim. Jim Fitzgerald. Janet. Paul Hogan. Jack. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Paul. I'm Paul Hogan. All right, thank you, Paul. Okay, Janet Powell. Um, Warner Gilliam. Okay. okay. Is, all right, there's Liz. We have Mike or Jim with us. Mike just sent an email that he couldn't make it. Okay, I didn't see that. Thank you. Okay. So let me, where's my agenda? Add that up. All right, so knocked off number one. Number two is review chapter 17, regional coordination, draft one. So okay. turn that over to Tom or, or Liz. I can speak to this one. Um, okay. I can, uh, I can share my screen here. Let's see, share screen. Is it, uh, how's it look from, from you guys? I bet it's not a... No, it's nice. It is? I, it's okay. There, okay. There you go. That's Good. it. Yep. Good. 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 Okay. Yeah, I'm, I haven't quite uh, mastered the little switch back and forth with screen sharing. Um, but uh, I guess we made it this far. Uh, so, uh, yeah, tonight's primary topic is regional coordination. And uh, I started off by looking at the, the wider region. Um, there's no set definition of where the region actually ends. But what we're looking at here on this map is, is the entirety of York County and Cumberland County. And in green, of course, you recognize uh, Kennebunk Park. Now, um, this part of the master plan is not like a, a typical uh, topic chapter that you've, we've been doing so far where we've been looking at um, strategies and, and goals and analyses. Uh, this is kind of a different animal. Um, and it, it, what, what's required by chapter 286 is that the town make a good faith effort to uh, coordinate and cooperate with other communities in the region. Um, and th when it was written, and they were primarily focused on lakes, rivers, aquifers, and transportation. But um, it, uh, they also, at the very end, I'm reading straight from the administrative rules, chapter 280. That's what I saw on the screen. Uh, okay. it, it, did, uh, it didn't limit it to those resources, or those topics. It said the plan must include a summary of regional coordination efforts from all applicable topic areas. So that's a pretty broad brush, I'd say. So um, when, when I started digging into it, I uh, discovered that uh, town of Kennebunkport has, has uh, really uh, has a, quite a history of collaboration. And there is a very broad um, range of applicable areas here. I, in in the, uh, the text that we sent you for the plan, when I grouped it into six different categories, regional planning, transportation, emergency response, public services, natural resources, climate change, and, and, and the economy. And these are some of the, the, the many areas where the Guinea Bug Court has taken the initiative to uh, uh, collaborate with towns near and far for, and it's been, uh, for the most part, mutual benefit. Now, if you 
back in chapter two, two away, one of the things we're, and I'll be asking you guys about this in a momentarily is, um, for the most part, you know, towns play well together, but sometimes they, they, uh, they, they have different points of view and they, they don't. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute too. Um, regional planning, um, it's quite, quite an interesting, uh, shape for a region. Um, I, I've talked to some of the folks at the uh, Southern Maine Planning and Development Commission. Their headquarters are down in, uh, Saco, right in the island in the river, and they were they were telling me that you know it takes takes quite a long time for them to get way up to the top of the region. That's how far out, how spread out the region is mm. in terms of regional planning. And uh, I mean, some of that's way up in, in Oxford County, and, and, and uh, uh, but the uh, the legislature decided that uh, everybody has to belong to some region. So those folks up in Sweden and Freiburg are in the same region as you are. It's almost like it follows the uh, Saco River kind of thing. Yeah, Honestly. yeah, yes, it does. Yeah, Saco goes right through Freiburg. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, what does the regional planning do? They they uh, they tackle issues that are too big for one town, but not really big enough for the state to to go in and take charge. Um, they they try to uh, address issues of common concern to uh, municipalities in the region. Um, they provide technical assistance. Now, um, Kenny Bunkport's lucky because you guys have the resources to, to have professional staff to, you know, just focus on your town. But most of the towns on this map do not. And, and uh, uh, you know, some developer will walk into town with a proposal and, you know, these guys aren't well prepared to, to respond. So that's when the, the regional planning sends, uh, sends some assistance. And then uh, I've always found one of the best things about regional planning commissions is, you know, when the, uh, um, the commissioners sit around and, and trade stories, you know, um, and they, they discover that they, a lot of things that they thought they were just facing alone, other towns are also dealing with and they're, they're, they're struggling for solutions. And sometimes they can, you know, they can find a solution just from talking to the people in the neighboring town. And um, Werner, you're, you're, on the, you're on the broadcast here, right? I don't see you on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah just here, jump so. in if you want, because I know Werner is, is not only in the commission, but he's also on the executive committee for the, uh, the Regional Planning Commission. So um, feel free to jump yeah. in and add to this if you like. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the other you know, the key pieces that that SMPDC gets involved with, and I think spends a fair amount of time uh, with managing, is they manage a fair amount of the EPA's uh, funding that gets distributed to uh, communities and different projects. Uh, they're also, you know, in charge of managing, you know, the brown, you know, the uh, brown field of cleanup uh, funding. And so, a lot of these redevelopment projects that you see happening in the region, uh, you know, so specifically a lot of the mill redevelopment projects, you know, where there's a fair amount of uh, environmental remediation that occurs. Um, you know, there's a fair amount and there's a complex uh, formulation of funding that goes into some of the cleanups for those projects and SMPC manages those as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, they were set, uh, they were set up, uh, you know, because they manage, you know, these funds uh, very well, they uh, were in a unique circum uh, situation to manage uh, a lot of the COVID funding that was, uh, that you know, that was being handed out uh, by you know, by the federal government. So a lot of that came down through from the feds to the state down to uh, the regional planning commission uh, that wound up being the ones that, you know, that they, they spent the time reviewing the, you know, the COVID business uh, applications uh, and then also managed the distribution of funds. So uh, in, in addition to all the other things that you have, you know, that you have mentioned here as well. Yeah, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty busy. I, uh, I was talking to Lee J. Feldman about a week ago, and he was saying they're out straight. They're just, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, they're on, uh, on all cylinders right now. There's a great demand for their services. How big is the staff? I'm sorry. Uh, it keeps getting bigger. <laughs> Werner? I was, yeah, I was wondering. 
let's say you've probably got about a dozen folks there that work for you know that work for SMPC. Uh, you know, uh, you know, big piece that they also provide, and you know, as Tom mentioned, the, uh, for some of the smaller towns, you know, they'll provide planning services. Whether you know whether that's in the form of of you know providing services for you know for a larger scale project, or it could be as simple as providing staff services to you know, to a planning board, uh, which okay. is uh, you know what happens in a fair amount of you know some of these smaller communities. Yeah, they'll, they'll sub out the you know the staff review of you know, site plans and subdivision apps. Hey Warner or Tom, just just um, I've never understood this since I've been on growth planning. Is um, how do they fit into the government structure and how are they funded? Are they a creature of the legislature? Well, you, yes, they were created by the legislature. Um, they, uh, they're good at um, pulling in a lot of federal funds. And then, uh, Werner, they, they, they charge local dues too, don't they? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. so it, 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 it's, it's a bit of a mix. You know, they're not, I mean, they're authorized by the, you know, by the legislature, uh, but they don't, you know, they don't hold any regulatory authority. You know, so they're not a, you know, they're not a, a governmental entity, you know, like, uh, you know, like local or county. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. in that sense, uh, they do uh, they do have a, a, a dues, you know, a fee structure for uh, for communities to pay dues. Um, and one, you know, one of the things that that they do send out each year is they'll they'll send out a notification to all the dues paying towns to, to spell out. So here's what you paid for dues, and here's what you received in exchange for that. And that's usually an interesting you know piece to see, uh, mm -hmm. you know what. Um, you know how communities uh, benefit from that. Uh, ironically, most communities, uh, they're uh, what they. So SMPDC also manages uh, large-scale uh, purchasing, uh, so they'll negotiate uh, you know, large-scale uh, purchases. For instance, pri you know, primarily for salt. Uh, you know, so a lot of communities will use their you know, they'll use their salt and sand uh, bid prices that they uh, that they'll negotiate. Uh, <laughs> they also uh, they'll all, they also negotiate on a large scale of office supplies. You know, so communities have the benefit of mm -hmm. you know of significantly reduced pricing for uh, you know for paper products and office supplies uh, and salt and sand. So most communities get the you know the cost that they pay in dues, uh, they they make back, uh, you know, multiple times back, uh, just in the savings, you know, from those types of services. There sounds like a good deal to me. And we're just going to move us into uh, something else. The regional planning is heavily involved in, and that's the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, um, commonly known as MPO, it's just because it's easier to say. And, and what their primary um, purpose is to uh, program and distribute and allocate uh, federal transportation funds to s uh, set priorities in the region and uh, choose which you know type of projects and which projects in particular are they would recommend for, for funding. Um, now these uh, MPOs, they're, they're centered around what are called metropolitan areas. That's just, uh, uh, you know, a fancy name for a, a part of the state or the region that has a, you know, concentration of population. Um, Kenny Bunkport is just outside of the MPO. Um, it's curious, you can see on the map, it, it's practically surrounded by the MPO. And, and you know, it's kind of odd that Arundel is in and Kenny Bunkport is out, but that's the way it is. Uh, this this can change over time. Every ten years, the federal government does the U.S. Census, and sometimes the, the boundaries of the metropolitan area are shifted around in response to the census. Uh, but I, I thought it was interesting was uh, even though Kenny McFord is not inside the MPO and doesn't get to vote or participate formally, uh, that they're, they're, you're right at the periphery. So what happens in the MPO is is could could impact your town or or could present you with an opportunity. At the very least, as, as um, Paul pointed out a few meetings ago, you know, in the advent of Uber and Lyft and ride-sharing services, um, you guys can 
come and go from Kenny Bunn Fort fairly easily and, and inexpensively. And you can, you know, for example, um, be right in the middle of the uh, whatever type of transit network that that the uh, the MPO is is set up, whether it's the Amtrak station or the airport or the or the bus lines. Um, so it's something worth keeping an eye on. Um, and that's why I've, I've included in this chapter, just because of your proximity. The are we formal, simply not in it? Are we just not in an MPO? You're not in an MPO. You're, 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 in a, you're considered rural. You're outside the metropolitan area. Got it. You're, Interesting. And that's interesting. set by the census? Uh, yes. Yeah, it is. And, and, and like I said, it's curious that Arundel is considered, you know, populated, but you're not. Hmm. That's the way it played out. Does, does any of that have to do with uh, the proximity of, you know, Route 95 and Route, route 1? Uh, I don't know, uh, Werner. It's always mystified me how they, how they uh, define those boundaries, but I'm sure there's a careful methodology because there's a lot of money in the table, you know. If, if you're inside, you have a shot at some federal dollars, and if you're not, you don't, you know. Oh, uh, any other comments, questions about the MPO? Okay. No. All right. Uh, bicycle routes, hiking trails, and parking all in one slide. The, the, the map uh, depicts the towns that are bisected by the Eastern Trail. The Eastern Trail is part of a larger planned bicycle uh, network that would run all the way from Calais down to Key West. Uh, um, as, as we mentioned during the presentation on the transportation chapter, uh, Kenny Bunn Port is not actually on the trail, but it, it's pretty close. You have easy access. You can go right up Log Cabin Road and, and you'd be on the Eastern Trail and you can either go north or south. Uh, so you have, you have good, you're good, good access to this trail. And this trail is, you know, pretty important piece of bicycle infrastructure in the state of Maine. Um, it's, most of it is been constructed, some of it isn't. It's it's a work in progress. Um, I forget what percent is played. I, I know it's the same situation down in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. There, you've got long stretches that are in have been built, and, and long stretches that are more challenging, and we haven't got there yet. Um, also, Kenny Bunk Port has uh, a, a network of hiking trails, and that's uh, due in large measure to the uh, Kenny Bunk Port Conservation Trust. They've been working at that for years, and they got a great network of trails, and, and they, uh, they maintain them as well. And then the last subject on this slide is parking. Uh, as, as everybody knows, the, uh, um, the tourist doesn't make much of a distinction between Dock Square and Lower Village. I think it's all kind of the same, and, and, and it functions kind of the same. And you know they'll they'll park on whatever side of the river they want to, whatever suits them. So in that sense, um, Kinney Bunk and Kinney Bunk Port have a shared arrangement in terms of public parking. And there's also uh, some trolleys nearby. There's actually several different trolley companies, and together they form the network, which they call the Shoreline Explorer. And the map on the right shows the the towns that are. Um, uh, are part of that network. So one way or another, you could take a trolley to any of those towns. Um, you might have to switch here and there. And then of course, getting by to the site of the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the biggest trolley museum in the world. Hmm. Emergency response. I spoke to uh, Chief Sanford, uh, he, he said that the town has signed three memorandums of understanding with uh, surrounding towns or nearby towns, three different topics. One is a, uh, is a mutual aid with the town of Kennebunk. Uh, the other is, um, you know, the, the um, protocol for, for assisting and being assisted by the regional tactical team. And the third one is, is actually brand new and it's something that originated uh, with the Kennebunk Fort Police Department. That is an agreement uh, to provide assistance to those towns that uh, have um, uh, are, are hit by COVID, meaning that um, if several police officers uh, test positive and they have to uh, go quarantine for two weeks, uh, you know, the bigger towns, they can handle that cycle better for they'd be fine. But um, 
these smaller towns, if they lose a few police officers for two weeks, that could present some problems. So what the arrangement allows is, is the other, the towns in the region have agreed that, you know, if, if, uh, if one of them uh, is, has some real staffing issues due to COVID, uh, the others will pitch in. They'll send officers right over there to perform their duties. So I thought that was pretty innovative. Um, then the, uh, the other way the, uh, the town collaborates is, is uh, emergency communications. When you dial 911, it doesn't go down to the local PD, it goes to town of York. And from there, uh, they, they send it back to uh, uh, Kennebunkport. New York is, is a regional hub for 911. And then emergency management, that's managed out of the uh, police department. They, they work closely with the York County Emergency Management. And we, the map on your right here you're looking at is, is, is York County. Um, other mutual, other uh, emergency response is mutual aid. Um, fire department, and Dan, I want you to jump in if I get this wrong. I talked to uh, Chief Everett and he, he said there's two different types of mutual aid. Uh, one is, he said, is a will call and the other is automatic. And Kenny Buncourt is, is, um, participates in the former. Meaning, um, if 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 he needs particular type of equipment in an emergency, he can call a nearby town, and they will send him that particular equipment, as opposed to automatic, which works differently. They just kind of, as soon as a signal goes out, they send somebody or something. Um, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Did I get that right? You got that right. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, that, that was new for me. Uh, and then the, uh, the Kenny Bunkport Emergency Management, uh, they have a formal mutual aid agreement with four communities, Arundel, Biddeford, Kenny Bunk, and Wells. And the photograph on the lower left, you probably recognize that. That was uh, uh -huh. a big fire in 1947 where, where mutual aid, uh, you know, really makes a difference because uh, no one town could have dealt with that. Uh, public services, water supply, Kenny Bunk, Kenny Bunk, Port and Wells Water District uh, provide your potable water. Their primary um, supply is, is Branch Brook. It flows out of Sanford and, uh, and it forms the boundary for, between Wells and Kenny Bunk. And uh, that's where most of your water comes from. But over time, it wasn't sufficient to serve the region. So uh, the water district has uh, agreements with two other water districts. The, uh, uh, the York Water District and uh, Biddeford Sacco. And, and New York is coming out of Chase Pond and, and uh, Biddeford has a, uh, a treatment plant on the, on the banks of the Sacco River. So you're, you're drinking one time or another, you guys are drinking water from all three sources. <laughs> uh, public school system, everybody's well acquainted with that. that uh, uh, three towns that uh, are, are are knit together in public schools. And, and the, the arrangement is, you know, if, at least with the elementary schools, if you're not happy with the one that's in your town, you can send your kid over to the elementary school in the next town over. Three towns, of course, are Kenny Bunk, Kenny Bunk, Ford, and Rundle. And then um, the middle school and high school are in Kenny Bunk. Um, that's RS, RS21, is it? Can you remember that? RSU21. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah RSU21, yep. But, okay. Solid waste, we talked about that. Uh, Couple couple meetings ago, um, Casella uh, has facilities in the region where they haul your trash to Dayton, Arundel, and, and uh, Wells, and then of course your your recyclables go to Eco Maine and Portland. If you have uh, stumps or brush or, or recyclable materials that are too big for pickup, you can haul them over to the Sea Road facility in Kennebunk. Um, except for metals, you'll be paying a fee for that service. And then uh, periodically, uh, Kenny Bunk, Kenny Bunk Port and Arundel um, hold a uh, household hazardous waste day where, where you can bring uh, chemicals and that you, you know don't belong in a landfill and you just, uh, you know, you set them aside until you, that, that, that day arrives and throw them in your car and they will, they will dispose of them properly. Natural resources. The Rachel Carson Na National Wildlife Refuge stretches along the southern Maine coast from Kittery up to, uh, I, I can't see it on my screen, is that uh, Cape Elizabeth, I think? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, okay. 
And uh, Kenny Mud Port's right in the middle there. Uh, you have you have a nice big chunk of the wildlife refuge right in the middle of your um, coastline. Um, and that's that's been around for for half a century. Um, and then uh, Liz touched on this when she presented on the natural resources chapter, the undeveloped habitat blocks is a couple thousand acres of undisturbed land up in the northern part of Kinnebunk Port uh, that's adjacent to undisturbed land in Arundel and Biddeford. It, 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 together, it, it adds up to 3,000 acres of, of land that um, provides a pretty much intact wilderness area, which is important for wildlife. And as, as the climate changes, it's going to become more important because there'll be stresses uh, all around, but particularly on the coast. Um, the, the, hmm? Somebody said something? The, yeah, I was just wondering whether the um, adjacent land is in private hands or public in Arundel and uh, Biddeford? I don't know the answer to that one, Paul, but that's a great, good question. Liz, are you with us? Do you know? I am with us. I do not know, but I think we could find that out. Um, we can take a look at the what we have for state data layers, and we can always reach out to the other municipalities if we can't find that information um, through the state database. Okay, so we'll 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 have an answer for you. Um, and then there's a there's another uh, a state program that recognizes uh, special habitats. They call it the beginning with habitat focus areas. Um, if I remember correctly, there's 140 of them in the state, and Kinnebunkport is the site of one and very close to another one. Um, it, it's, uh, Kinnebunkport shares the Vernal Pool Complex uh, with Biddeford. It, 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 uh, the, the resource is, doesn't respect the municipal boundary, it's on both sides. And then there's the, uh, the uh, Yugangquit Wells um, uh, Salt Marsh, which, ex which extends north and east all the way to the Kennebunk River. Uh, then for, for quite a few years, I think since 1995, Kennebunk and Kennebunk Port have been cooperating on management of the Kennebunk River. Um, that obviously, they're, they're paying attention to a lot of the environmental issues and, and pollution, but they're, they're also um, very much involved in uh, allocating moorings and making sure that the boaters are, uh, you know, everybody gets treated fairly down there. Uh, aquifer protection is important. There's an aquifer up in the, the, the northern part of Kennebunk Port. It uh, stretches right into Biddeford. And uh, the city of Biddeford has, has an aquifer protection overlaying zone, which is going to protect the water supply, at least on that side of the border. And then uh, water testing we've discussed before uh, at the beaches um, in, 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 in um, the, the, the main, uh, I'm forgetting the name, Paul. Is it the, the Little River? Yeah, the Little River is where they test, along with Goose Rocks. But the name of the program is Clean Beaches. Oh, Clean, Mean, Healthy, um, healthy, healthy Beaches. Healthy healthy beach. beach. It's got it. Yeah, okay. Healthy All right, yeah. Yeah, so that, that program tests the water right up the Little River, which is, of course, uh, um, the other side of the river is in uh, Biddeford. Hey, Tom, what's the effect of the overlay district in Biddeford for that watershed? It prevents a developer from uh, doing unhealthy things on top of the water supply. It restricts the use of the land. So is zoning? Yes, it uh, is. Yeah. Zoning has changed there from what it would be somewhere else? You have to develop well, well, it, it's an overlay zone, which means it's probably zoned re residential or rural or something. And meaning, okay, you can build a house, but then, but then the overlay zone will throw in some additional restrictions mm -hmm. to to um, make sure whatever that underlying zone does doesn't doesn't endanger the water supply. So it's yeah, a good thing, yeah. But the city of Biddeford is protecting their aquifer, and, and that's that's something you should be thankful for. The last time I had, I, you know, that I'd looked at the uh, the overlay language there in Biddeford, which was you know, a number of years ago. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, there were specific types of uh, land use activities, you know, that weren't permitted, you know, within those, uh, within that overlay. Uh, and, and I, I want to say they had placed some restrictions around their extractive industry uses, 
you know, so you know, mm. they weren't necessarily going to have, uh, you know, some, you know, strip, you know, some, well, what I, what I call strip mining, but, you know, gravel pits and things of that nature that had been, you know, I think a lot of that was in response to the fact that there had been a lot of, of, you know, gravel and sand pits up in that, you know, up in that area. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, a lot of what the aquifer protection uh, was meant to, you know, meant to curb. Uh, so, you know, that yeah. we're not, we ever considered that yeah. on our side of the land, water protection would seem to be important, even though it's not a municipal water source it's for a lot of people who live around there. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, you know, that's, that's a good, that's a good question. You know, I think a lot of what showed up in Biddeford was in response to, you know, specific activities that, you know, that were happening. I'm not aware of there uh, ever having been a proposal to extend, you know, that aquifer protection uh, district in the port. Werner, if, if the comp plan were to recommend it be extended, do you, do you think that would be well received here in town? Yeah, I mean, I don't see where, I don't see where there would be any objection to, you know, to extending some type of, you know, aquifer protection, you know, uh, in, you know, in, into town. Especially okay. since our, you know, since our, our development is predominantly residential and in those areas up and through there, that's where folks get their, you know, they get their water. All right. Well, that's, uh, let's plan on that. Then. Well, so. yeah, I, I, kind of, I, I think I'd kind of want to know what the restrictions are in a res residential area before, you know, putting a stamp yep. on it. Yeah. Some of them, I mean, you I mean, do private, have to get private property is private property. I mean, we don't want to tell somebody they're, property still an investment per se it's not poison you know you know we want to at least i i want to know what the restrictions are sure and that's not sure. Saying, it's like extractive uh so while there were lots of gravel pits in the past you probably couldn't do that in the future um if it was within that zone um I don't know what else we extract in Maine other than gravel and sand. Yeah, gravel and granite, you know, because I think what, you know, what happened in some of those areas up and through there is that, you know, it was extracted down to the water table. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and so, you know, and so I was going to say, I, I would assume sand would be a good filtering or, or gravel's a good way for water yeah, to move, it, but it, who knows? It is. It's a great filter until you dig it all out down to the water table. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and then, and then, you know, and then again, I think, you know, a big part of it is just that, you know, it's, it's a protection of the water supply for those folks in that area that draw, you know, the draw from that area as the drinking water supply. Yeah. 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 These, these type of overlay districts can be quite broad. Um, typically they're focused on keeping chemicals from, from getting into the right. Air. Right. You know, what you want to avoid is somebody saying, oh, this is this is a home occupation. It's, you know, I can do what I want. And then you find out that they're, they've got some nasty stuff on site. You know? yep. Yeah, I'd be, I mean, I'd be curious to know. I mean, I know, you know, water predominantly walks, goes through the veins as opposed to other places. Maybe it's different where they don't have as much rock and stuff in different other countries. I don't know how water moves in other areas, you know. Yeah. It'd be interesting to learn what the restrictions are. I've yeah, worked so with a couple, oops, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say I've worked with a, a few municipalities in New Hampshire on adopting aquifer or wellhead protection overlay districts. And they can, the, the state um, Depart, Department of Environmental Services in New Hampshire has a model ordinance that many communities start with and work from. And there are, um, there's quite a range of different types of um, I would say re restrictions that can be included, ranging from the type of use to, you know, reducing the ex extractive industries as mentioned, but also sometimes extra stormwater management requirements for um, development, residential or commercial development, depending on the amount of uh, impervious surfaces. So it's, you know, the communities can really tailor that type of ordinance to what they think best fits their needs, but it, it's definitely worth, um, you know, vetting yeah. the idea with the public first, because yeah. it's, um, it can be complex to understand and, um, it, and it does 
often impact what, what you can and can't do with your, yeah, with your property. That, that's why, yeah, it's, it sounds sexy, but you know, it's worth discussing further before it's. Sure, absolutely. Hey, and just uh, quickly, I looked at our, our 2012 plan and, and we talked a little bit about this in the water resource section. And we had a statement in here, and I, I really don't recall the details, but we said the Bitterford's official zoning map puts their portion of this aquifer in the aquifer protection overlay, and their comprehensive plan lists restrictions comparable to shoreland zoning. Oh. Um, so that was sort of a, you know, that's what we have, that's what they have. And then we did have a strategy to develop some regulations to protect the area is one of the things for the planning board. And we, have, we believe have, have a short section in the current draft of the water yeah, resources chapter too, but yeah. definitely something to explore further. Yep. yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's the tough thing. Like I, in another town, Phippsburg, they adopted the shoreland zoning. It's 250 feet around. And if you own a piece of property, there's nothing you can do. I mean, it's unless you, you know, unless you get a variance, you know, if you're trying to build yeah. a house or do certain things, you know, it's, it's, it, li it limits it you a bit. It limits you a bit for sure. Yeah. And that's, I didn't mean to use the term loosely as poison, but if you own a piece of property, but you can't do anything, not, I'm not saying that developers want to do everything or somebody wants to build something, but you yeah. know, you know, you're paying for something that you can't even live or thrive on. You know, the, the, uh, the challenge might, not be so formidable because a lot of the uh, the land up in that part of town is is already conserved. It's, uh, yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to see the um, to see where it actually is. I don't really. I mean, I know where that intersection is that you mentioned in the narrative, um, but I I just in my mind I don't know where that goes. Uh, should we should we bring a map back in uh, at the next meeting? Sure. Yeah. We have yeah. a map in the water resources chapter that uh -huh. uh, I can pull okay. up while we're talking too. Sure, sure. Well, we yeah. do that. We do that. Yeah. So we don't. Yeah, that, that's anything. where that's where this really should live, right? I mean, all the details associated with it, yes. and we refer back yes, to it. Yes, so. Of course. Yeah. 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 The way Chapter Two Eight works is there's a lot of redundancies. You know, you might have noticed that already, and, and mm -hmm. that's the way it's set up. So we've been kind of following along Two O Eight, but you know, uh, be, be, before the end of the uh, the project, we'll be eliminating a lot of that redundancy. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, you're referring back here, to it, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in 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 this chapter, if we had regional coordination. It would certainly be worth mentioning. We don't have regional cooperation with respect to it, the aquifer. But if we want to, you know, we, we've had it as a strategy before. If we want to continue, then of course we should mention it here. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Good point. And then, you, if you remember right at the beginning of the slideshow, one, the, one of the questions to a white ask is, "Well, are there any issues where you're not quite in sync?" You know. Right. Right. <laughs> So I, so I just took a look, you know, I've got the, um, you know, Biddeford Aquifer Protection District Performance Standards pulled up. And it looks like it, it gets into, you know, it gets into, you know, not allowing for large scale use of herbicides or pesticides. You know, it's talking about uh, manure and uh, fertilizer needing to conform to best management practices. Same thing, erosion and sedimentation minimized by using, uh, you know, erosion control management practices, uh, storage of hazardous amounts, salt and sand piles uh, not being pro or being prohibited, uh, below ground storage of petroleum products uh, being prohibited, you know, some restrictions on weight, uh, industrial wastewater for sewage, so in other words, no land application of it. Uh, yeah, so those those types of those types of standards is what. Mm. And again, I'm just being real quick in general with it, but yeah, yeah. that's those are the types of things that are in there. Well, I guess it is kind of broad based. It wasn't just uh, gravel pits, I know. No, ironically, you know, I I looked at it and, and pits were permitted. Uh, there. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, pit, pits are permitted in you know in that in that location, um, and it is uh, it 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 does seem to be more particularly focused on you know just some performance standards really surrounding you know application of you know elements to the land you know and uh, not allowing it more on a larger scale commercial basis and and you know identifying you know the need for using best you know best management practices. So I, I suspect some of that language is probably a little bit outdated. Uh, you know, I, since, you know, most approvals nowadays are going to require, just as a general rule, are going to require best management practices. Um, before we leave this area, yeah. um, one issue kind of that I am aware of because of being involved in the water testing is that, um, you know, while we have cooperation with Kennebunk, um, with respect to the Kennebunk River, we do not have a similar kind of arrangement or cooperation with Bitterford with respect to the Little River. And while it's not a commercial river like the Kennebunk River, we do have um, pollution issues. Mm -hmm. And whenever it's brought up, you know, the answer is, well, you know, it, it, you know, it could be coming all from Bitterford or half of it could be coming from Bitterford. And so we have no way to deal with the problem because it's a shared problem. So it would seem to me it would be aspirational if you wanted the water to get cleaner that you would try to work with Bitterford on that problem. Absolutely, and you know you have a you have a um, a model down at the Kennebunk uh, River. I mean, you've been mm -hmm. doing that for twenty five years successfully. Right. Yeah. You think there'd be support in, uh, in the community for for approaching Bitterford like that? Certainly, from the uh, people at Goose Rocks who uh, confront it. All right. Um, how's the committee feel about uh, making that a recommendation in the comp plan? I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, this, this the river has been named, you know, so many times in terms of the pollution and and the, the water testing, as Paul said. So, you know, that's um, granite, uh, Fortune's Rocks, and gra Granite Point, right there. Mm -hmm. um, I would suspect that the people in that neighborhood don't want a polluted river. <laughs> I, I would say. It's 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 a it's a very important thing to bring up. All right, you know what else we can do? I, I could I could make a phone call to the, the planning director in Bitterford just to you know um, see see if that's ever been discussed over there. Good idea. They don't test you know to the the reason we're aware of it and it's probably not on their agenda is the state program test beach beaches mm. period. And it ha we happen to have two rivers that lead to our beaches, right? to our beach, our primary beach in town. And so we test the river mouth. We don't test the rivers. We test the river mouth because mm -hmm. that's the way the state program was designed. Biddeford doesn't test anything near that area. So it's not on their radar screen. And mm -hmm. there, um, you know, I have no idea. I'm sure, uh, Warner, do you know if they participate in Maine Healthy Beaches for their oceanfront beaches? Yeah, it, it's a good question. I, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of, of what their participation looks like. Uh, I've, I've not heard reference to, you know, to Biddeford being part of the program. Uh, it, you know, and I, I, I suspect that they, you know, that uh, Biddeford probably Is doesn't it? have, doesn't have the same, you know, attachment, um, you know, the Goose Rocks as Goose Rocks does, or as any bunk port, you know, in general does. Right, and and the, the um, you know, there's only a, um, the, you know, the, the sandy beaches at, um, at Biddeford Pool would not be so impact unless they're getting it from the Saco River, um, but then it would have to make its way 
you know, there's a little tiny sandy beach on the Saka River in Biddeford, but they probably don't test there. Yeah, I, I just found online that the Middle Beach in Biddeford is sampled bi-weekly from June 12th to September 7th, and it is Maine Healthy Beaches program. Okay, got it. Good so research. That's one, one beach, Middle Beach. But it's far huh. from the mouth of the river, and we yeah. have a unique problem to go to the river. Right. The if we didn't have right, river, our beach is right there, right. Yeah, if we, if we didn't have rivers, we wouldn't have a problem. I think it's worthy of giving them a call and following yeah. up with us, okay. and, and maybe a collaboration yeah. to put in there is just to, to make an effort to work together. Right. Well, you know, if, if it's not on their radar screen, they can say, well, there's some interest over here, you know. <laughs> I mean, there is a lot, there's monitoring at, at these beaches in Biddeford, but the river is a specific, unusual site, right? They have, they have a Biddeford beach manager named Carl Walsh, if you want to call Carl, you might know. Yeah, because of his number and everything. All right. Liz, are you still looking for the uh, aquifer map? I have it. Um, I just can't share my screen until you stop, I think. Oh, okay. Do you want to, do you want to jump in now or should we wait till this is no, done? No, no, no. No, let's go through. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Ready to, ready to move on beyond Little River now? We Here we go. Sure. Yeah. Climate change. That's another way uh, there's some collaboration going on. Is my understanding is is, uh, uh, is the Kennebunk Port Town Manager initiated the uh, the Regional Sustainability and Resilience Program, and, and basically that's the recognition that you know, this is a big problem, uh, requires some technical expertise, and none of these uh, six towns that we're looking at here on the right. Um, you know, we're really ready to hire a full-time staff member to do that, but they recognize the benefit of sharing somebody at a much less cost. And, um, so that's, that's pretty interesting program. Um, I don't know if you notice it's, it's, it was highlighted in the, uh, the, the main climate action plan that was just published in December. It was phrased as, 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 as a great, great way to, um, address climate change, um, because, you know, Maine has, has a, a lot of small towns that don't have the resources to, to really take it on. But the, the whole concept of banding together and doing it cooperatively has is, is got some folks excited. Is this done under the auspices of Southern Maine Regional Plan or whatever it's called? Are yes, they're it is. They're providing the uh, of space for, uh, for uh, uh, Karina Greater and uh, we discussed at the last meeting having Karina and Abby Sherwin come to meet with with the Growth Planning Committee. They uh, they uh, they readily accepted our invitation. They just can't be with us tonight. Um, so while we're on the topic, how's uh, how's your April six meeting sound? Would that be a good time to to host Abby and uh, Karina? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's what we'll plan on that. Um, and they'll, uh, they, they, it's quite impressive that they, they're doing a lot of work and they're, they're, they, they're working several different programs at once. So they'll, they'll have plenty to share with us. In fact, Paul, that was one of the news articles you, uh, you pulled up for us today was the regional coordination. That's Abby and Korean. Yeah. They're the authors. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Abby. Yeah. Maybe we can get out a notice or something to, um, they'll be much more interesting than we are. <laughs> uh, we might get some people to join us. Good you know, idea. If we sent out a. Um, no, let's, do that. Just, let's do that. Let's do that. On give, Facebook. I'll give Abby a heads up that we're going to make her famous down here in Canadian Bud Four. And then the other uh, really cool program is initiated in Kenny Monkport, but it actually covers a wider region, is, is the Conservation Trust Climate Initiative. And uh, that, that, of course, is headquartered at, at, with the uh, Kenny Bunk uh, Conservation Trust, but they've partnered with some interesting groups. They partnered with the uh, University of New England and with the Gulf of Maine Institute. So in that sense, it's, it's kind of a regional venture and their primary focus is on uh, education and then they're particularly focused on educating uh, young people and harnessing that energy to to, uh, to join the campaign mm -hmm. then uh, 
uh, a program similar to the, uh, the the climate cooperation program, also uh, um, being initiated by Southern Maine um, Planning Development Commission, is the Building Economic Resilience, and that's also uh, a cooperative effort among the towns uh, along Southern York County coast. Um, and, and their focus, as the title suggests, is to um, find ways to help uh, uh, small businesses um, respond to climate change and, and bounce back and do what they need to do to, to survive the challenges ahead. Um, another area of uh, regional cooperation is the Chamber of Commerce, you got the, the Kenny, Bun Kenny Bunport and Arundel Chamber of Commerce. Um, and they've been around for quite a long time and, and, they, and they're pretty effective at what they do. And then uh, I, you probably remember early in this project, I was pretty impressed with the Cape Porpoise Archaeological Alliance and how they found that, that dugout canoe that uh, this is one of the few that ever been in New England. It's on display right now at the Brick at the Brick Store Museum. There's really? there's an exhibit, so if anybody's in, interested. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So. Uh, Although it's entitled Cape Porpoise, their, their, their geographic range is a little broader. It actually goes, uh, you know, east and west of Cape Porpoise, um, beyond the bounds of Kennebunkport. So that's why I thought it would be a candidate for this chapter. Sure thing. So that's, that's what I have to say about regional cooperation and coordination. I'm, I'm impressed with such a, you know, a small town having their, uh, reaching out to so many, uh, communities in so many different ways. Yeah, that uh, table at the end is pretty... Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot about the table. Yeah, here yeah. we go. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah, it is. When, when you, you see it on one screen, you realize, uh, you know, you, there's, there's not even 4,000 people in Kennebunk for and you guys are all over the place. Hmm. Yeah, that was a good idea. If it was yours or Liz's? It's a great table. Yeah. Well, Liz had a great table before, and I kind of copied it. So. Okay. <laughs> it's flattery, Liz. Imitation. <laughs> so um, I think I think that's a great visual to have there. You know, it yeah. Highlights, exactly. Certainly highlights a lot a lot of what the town's doing. I was just thinking uh, that this also could be used if you use different colors on areas where, like we want, we've talked about here already, where we may want to improve or try to mm -hmm. increase uh, regional cooperation. Excellent. Just, I see. Yeah, really just good. To kind of move or increase. And while we have this massive uh, spreadsheet in front of you, does anybody see anything that doesn't look quite right? We got the dots in all the right places. God knows. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, um, as you did your research, you know, what was the, where did you find, you know, the information, you know, for all the other communities? Was that just, you know, looking at their comp plans and seeing, you know, where they identified areas? Um, actually, no, Warner. The uh, I started with Kennebunk Port, and for example, you know, I said, well, where exactly does Kennebunk Port's trash go to, you know, and Casella picks it up and hauls it away, and where do the recyclables end up, and then, mm -hmm. so I always started at Kennebunk Port and kind of branched out, you know, and where, yeah. where does Kennebunk Port go to high school, you know, uh, I called up the police chief and said, you know, tell me about mutual aid, and, 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 and you know, I, otherwise I never would have known about the COVID initiative, you know. Yeah. Got it. So these dots are all in, in for the other communities are all in relationship to Kenny Bunk Fort. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what mm -hmm. you have them coming. That's where you have them coming. And you notice on, on Kenny Bunk Fort um, ribbon, there's, there's two over here on the left that don't have dots, and that's right, right. It's because you you have proximity to those regional initiatives, but you're not actually in them. Yeah, that's a great okay. way to show it. Okay. So at this point, we can move on to uh, survey questions for our next survey, or we can jump into uh, uh, what Liz has found out about the aquifer. Well, yeah, why don't we take a look at the aquifer, I would suggest, and then we'll hop into the uh, outreach. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
So um, let's see. Uh, stop share. Okay, I got it. There we yep. go. Okay. So let me just get the right screen up. Okay, so do you see a map? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so this purple area here is the, um, is the aquifer, both patches. And so this area that's uh, shaded just over the town line is what's uh, essentially covered by the, um, by Biddeford's overlay district. And then this small portion of that aquifer um, it's not covered, obviously, by the um, city of Biddeford's regulations. But if you were to look at, um, for example, creating an overlay district that encompassed your fire yield aquifers, you would likely create those boundaries um, over the purple areas. Mm -hmm. So it's not contiguous between the border area and the Witten Hill intersection that you described it's two separate you yeah, mean these like these two areas yeah. yeah yes so i'm guessing so what's mapped here is the um 50 10 to 50 gallon gallons per minute yields i believe um and so there's probably a, depending on the underlying geology um you know, there might be a lower yield aquifer right in between um, mm -hmm. that area um, or, you know, like more bedrock right there. I have to look over at the, um, like a ge geology map to, mm -hmm. okay. to really figure that out. I was imagining from the original description that it was a big contiguous area. Mm -hmm. this, this is much less than I was trying to visualize that whole area. So I'm glad we looked at it. That's pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Should we jump yep. back to Tom's slides? Let me see if I can. Oh. Surrender. Surrender the screen. Yeah. Let me. Um, so, there we go. So any other questions for Tom or Liz on Chapter 17? Okay, hearing none, I think we're ready for a public outreach discussion. Okay. Go. Um, now I, I see my screen. Can you see it? I can't see you guys, though. I did something wrong here. We can see you. Oh, I can't see you. Actually, you know, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, there you are. Okay, you're back again. I can see you now. Can you still see the screen? No, I can't because I haven't shared it yet. Here we go. Yeah. There. How's that look? Yep. Now we see the chart that you had. Excellent. Mm -hmm. The table. Yep. All right. Moving from the chart to the next survey. Uh oh. I was afraid of that. Let's see. There we go. Game control. So at the uh, last meeting, we were uh, we, we 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 spent some time talking about our proposed survey questions for mini survey number two, and um, so we weren't quite there yet. And we agreed to to um, resume the conversation this evening. Um, Paul had a great idea, and then with uh, question number one not having to do with a topic, but rather and just alerting people that, um, that survey number one uh, is out there, and if they haven't taken it yet, uh, just click that link and they'll be able to take it. Um, the uh, the next one was, uh, as I recall, we were all pretty much in agreement. Number two there was uh, was okay. Where we tripped up was with this question, because the way um, I had worded it, um, at least one of you guys had thought we were talking about um, mountain biking in the woods or something, and that wasn't that wasn't my intent. I had I had, you know was thinking of rail trails and paved pathways yep. through natural areas for joggers and pedestrians and bicyclists. 
the idea being that they'd, they'd be separated from the highway and it'd be more um, peaceful and a safer experience for the pedestrians and bicyclists. So that was my intent. And obviously I hadn't worded it clear enough if, uh, for the growth planning committee um, interpreted differently than I intended. Certainly the, the general population would as well too. So um, here is, here's another effort at wording that uh, I tried to make sure we weren't gonna be mistaken for mountain biking here. Um, what do you guys think? Are we, we closer? Yep, I'm just thinking as uh, from a pathway standpoint, yeah. We want to say paved or just leave it as pathways. I mean, would a gravel pathway? I'm, I'm fine with gravel, um, but what I was trying to avoid is getting this mixed up with uh, mountain biking. You know? yeah, Why don't true. we just say dedicated pathway? <clears throat> dedicated? Yeah, yeah, dedicated. That sounds good. All right. Any other word changes here? You think it captured it okay? People are going to understand what we're looking for? I do. I think yep. so. Yep. All right. Okay. I, I, have, a, I, have, I have a question just uh, trying, to, um, trying to understand, like, what this would look like. Uh, so do you envision, like, you know, that you would have, I don't know, easements that would, you know, that would cut across properties where you would have these types of paths, you know, so, like, some type of, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm guessing an easement that would, Come across the property. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Um, and and uh, I'm going to throw it open to the community because you know the, the residents know the town a lot better than I do. But um, just for example, and you guys have probably already explored this. You could you could have a um, easement across the village parcel from one end to the other. Um, the town owns it now, so you guys are in the driver's seat. You know? So that could that could be. Uh, it could be a, um, a feature of the, uh, whatever happens at the village parcel in the future, you'll have a paved bicycle, bicycle path running across from, what is it, School Street to North? Is it, did I get the street? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, North to, north to School. Yeah, so that, that's slow hanging fruit, but that's that's my vision is, um, is wherever you have these opportunities and, and there's the public will and willing to, to fund it, um, uh, you start building and pretty soon you'll have a network. And the idea right. being to provide people at, you know, someplace other than the side of the highway to, to ride the bikes because, um, you know, the shoulders are, are good. At the, they're safer than no shoulders, but it's much better if you're off in a, you know, completely separate from the roadways. Right. And rail trails, they're, they're a great example where, where you know, um, that's been taken advantage of because they, the easement's already in place. The railroads did all the hard work 100 years ago. It's just a matter of uh, taking up the, uh, the rails and replacing them with uh, uh, pavement or, or, or um, stone dust or gravel. Mm. Yeah, Warren, are we, at the last meeting, we were, yeah. someone raised the question of uh, the old rail line that used to go out to Cape Corpus, you know, to Sanford. Is that still in existence? Would that be a uh, mm -hmm. you know, possibility? Yeah, I, I, I mean, did a little. Re I tried to do some research. I could. I could only find historical images and the story of the railroad. It's very well documented, but it doesn't say anything about the condition, location, or accessibility of those abandoned ra uh, la rails anywhere. I just something to keep looking for. Well, more importantly, who owns the land? Yeah. I'm going to think, I'm going to the brick store to do some research next week. I can ask them; they might know. Well, I think that's you know that's the that's probably the biggest challenge that you have there is that most of all that property is in private ownership. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so you've yeah. got to have willing you have to have willing partners to be able mm -hmm. to come to you know to come to an agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I you know I agree. I think those you know those old um, those old railways you know those are you know it's a great reuse of those areas. You know, to, to do some type of, you know, your recreational path, you know, right. through there, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, for bikes or pedestrians. Yeah. Is that, are those railways federal property? No, no, no. no. They're, they're private, privately owned. So it's, e so, so it's an existing easement over private property? Nope. What? The, no. The, the interest. What, I'm sorry? The, the interest that's owned. 
That's, yeah, that's interesting, Marna, because yeah, most, yeah. most of them are yeah, right ways, but the fee interest, you know, increases the possibility of a bike path, you know? Right. Yeah, right. yeah, I mean, in some circumstances there, you know, you have the, you know, you may still have the underlying property owner uh, that owns it, but, you know, what's been, you know, what's been negotiated has been easement. You know, that was, and I think most of those are back whenever you still had an active, you, know, you had an active rail company, you know, that, uh, that didn't, you know, that didn't release their, their interest in the easement. And so they were able to, you know, transfer those over, you know, for yeah. recreational purposes. What's the, uh, what's the, what is the typical, um, um, easement width on something like that. What do you think it is? I mean, it all under hundred feet from the center, or you know, I'm just curious. No, 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 that probably smaller than that. Small, much smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty feet, thirty feet. Twenty, yeah, that's what I would think. Twenty to thirty feet. Yeah. I'm just always considering multi-use too, not just necessarily bikes, you know, or, or yeah. walking. And again, if it's in the middle of the woods and it's there's an opportunity to always encourage hunting as well. Yeah, they, they, there's hunting on it for sure. I can tell you that. Yep. Yeah. But I, I'm not, so I'm not a big biker, but Paul, I, I don't know if you, you do that. Is there, would uh, changing it, what's the best medium to put, to, to ride a bike on? Because I know, we weren't necessarily talking about mountain bikes. We were talking about like regular, almost like, you know, hard surface bikes. What would the recommended um, half be covered with? No, my, my preference is bitum bituminous concrete, you know, asphalt. Uh, Salisbury, Massachusetts has had a good experience with what they call um, compacted stone dust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Inexpensive. It's right. inexpensive. That's why they go with <laughs> I just don't have the money <laughs> to get the hot top. Yeah, pretty hard too. Well, no, it is, and it is good. I mean, it, it does dry up like concrete. I've used it a lot, mm -hmm. and it, but but it also allows water to, to go right through, which mm -hmm. is good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that that town has done a great job. They have a whole network of old rail lines, and they're all uh, wow. they're all bike paths now. Well, four miles of that old railway is in the trolley museum. It's at the trolley museum. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. But, but is that my understanding, they reserve it for trolleys, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the question. Are they using it? Are they yes. running on yeah. it? You know? Yeah, no, they, they use it. it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I bring my kids on so. that. But this, I think this, it only goes so far, and then I think it continues down, and I don't uh -huh. know if they own that or not. Uh-huh. I don't know if that's enough. To, it goes it all the way to, to Bitterford. It connects to the trust trails uh, at one spot. There's a connection now. Yeah. yeah. My, my understanding is that if you were to follow it, that it, uh, I believe it, it followed along Log Cabin Road. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then once you hit the end of Log Cabin Road, you know, you know, you know where the trolley museum is at, then it continues you know, along, you know, along the you know, border there and uh, Pennybunk Port Arundel, mm -hmm. uh, where where you've got the spur, uh, but then then in, in in you know what's the old townhouse corners area, you know is yeah. where it picked up, and then runs across you know parallel really to Old Cape Road, and then that's what runs it down into Cape Corpus, and um, you know if if you do any digging at the you know historical society, or even if you ever go out, you know if you ever go out. Cape Corpus Pier. You get a chance, you know, you take take a ride out the pier road, and uh, you can even still see, you know, you can see underneath mm -hmm. the, the underlying pavement there, you know, from time to, you know, the, you can still see the ripples, you know, from, you know, uh, from what I'm assuming, you know, are the old cross ties of the rail, uh, of the rail line of the pavement yeah. there. Yeah, if you if you if you look on Google Maps, um, it sort of shows it, doesn't identify it, but you see a long strip of uh, two lines running parallel, pretty much, 
from Beechwood Ave all the way down to uh, Mills Road. Actually, right at the back of somebody's house, just before Mills Road. Oh, so it's possible that, uh, you know, yeah. the land was owned in fee, um, is a single owner. Whoever that is. I, I had heard a story that it, there was a single owner that had somehow got a hold of the deed. Um, I, I don't know if that was true or not. In, in, in New Hampshire, when it became apparent that the Boston and Maine Railroad was abandoning their, most of their rail, they, uh, they passed a state law that says that the, uh, the state would get first dibs on purchasing the, the rail corridors. Mm -hmm. and for the most part, they did. The uh, Rails to Trails Conservancy has a quite extensive um, resource. Oh, yeah, I see it on the... On the uh, um, it's a mate, or is that a power line, Dan, or is that a... Well, there, there is actually a power line that runs next to it. Um, but if you look like a, up at the five corners, they actually call it Butter Lane, which there's really no road there. Um, and then there's a trail, and then alongside the trail for that first section is, is power lines down to Beechwood from, from uh, North Street. It kind of cuts through there. And then it goes across, and the power lines kind of go right and then go up yeah, through yeah. Northwoods. Or Bishop's Woods. Anyway, that Conservancy website, you know, has every tool you'd ever need if you wanted to attempt a project. I think the question is, works the way it is, because you're going to find out if there's people sure. that want to have the off-road off road use, or if they're saying, you know, more comfortable with, you know, let's utilize what we have and, you know, build off it to make it more comfortable for bikers. Yeah. You know, which is the second part of the question, really. The, uh, the other thing I like about it, it's it, the open-ended part. It's, it's, it's kind of reaching out to the community and saying, you know, are, are there any places that we haven't thought of? And I bet there are. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You guys ready for the next question? Sure. sure. All right, here we go. Well, we saw that last time, so there's nothing changed here. Yeah, it was that last question about the bike paths. That's what we got stuck on last meeting. Um, and then the, uh, the final question is the recreational facilities. Everybody thought that was okay two weeks ago. I think we were going to add and cultural. And cultural. Yeah. 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 Yes. Cultural. Good point. Good point, Jen. I'm annoying. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's all right, Jen. Good. I was talking and taking notes at the same time last time, so nice. I'm not surprised I missed it. My uh, fault. I missed the meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See what happens when you don't come? I was yep. sick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, finally, and Paul had another good idea last time. He says instead of the uh, question number six, we say, hey, hey, go look at the results so far from the, the survey before. And there you go. Yeah. Would, would it be helpful on question five to have some examples of what, you know, of what a cultural or, you know, a recreational facility might be? Mm. Mm. That one kind of examples come to mind. Well, I mean, necessary. when you think recreational facilities, I mean, some folks will think, you know, will think playgrounds, you know, others might right. think of, you know, I mean, something else, uh, you know, cultural, you know, what's the cultural? Yeah, you know, what is, you know, what, what is that? You know, I just think maybe an example or two might, you know, might be helpful. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. One thing we could do is point people to the draft chapter. Um, and say like these mm -hmm. these facilities are identified in the draft. Yeah. Um. Because that might. Yes. You know, get folks it looking might, at the, it, it at the might chapter occur. and give them some ideas. Yeah, I like that idea. I, I like that too because they also could check the list and they may have other things that they have to contribute right. that we've missed. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right. That's, That's a great idea. idea. Right. <laughs> And those that don't want to do it, it leaves it open-ended for them. They can come up with their yeah. own. Right. What they identify as cultural or recreational. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a good call. 
point them, point them to where there's some already identified. Yeah. yeah, and like you said, it gets them to read the chapter, too. Maybe. Hmm. So, uh, you think we're in good shape for uh, wording for survey number two? Yeah, yeah, with those changes noted. Okay, all right. And uh, the other thing, Werner, I want to catch up with you. And I, I see you on the screen right now, so I, I will. Um, <laughs> the, the one thing I want to avoid was um, repeating some of the same questions that were um, sent out in 2018. Um, we're going to want to get redundant and, you know, ask the same question and people say, hey, didn't I already answer this? You know? um, so I've been, I've been trying to kind of compile that data. What, what, what I have got my hands on was this PowerPoint with kind of a summary of the results, but um, I don't, what I don't have is the, is the raw numbers. I was wondering if you had that handy. Okay. Answer. Yep. Yeah, I can dig, I can dig through what I've got. You're looking for the, the raw data on the exactly. yeah. surveys. Yep. Once, I, once I get that, I can manipulate it a lot easier and say, okay, here are the questions that have been asked already. Mm -hmm. That way I'm less likely to ask them again. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. I'll, I'll dig around for that. Good. Good. Thanks. So um, that's it for my presentation this evening. Uh, you guys have other topics you'd like to talk about? Well, I did, well you know, as I was reading some of uh, the links that Paul sent, uh, it got me thinking about our plan and how it's, we're writing it for the next, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be updated for another 10 years, even though I mean, we're looking a little further out than that because of climate change and when that's going to happen. Um, but also knowing that even the climate change numbers seem to be changing and will change as time goes forward. How do we, how do we write the plan so that it allows us to maybe adjust strategies and goals without having to go back to the state or go back to the town and ask for them to, you know, um, modify it? So we get, you know, so that when we get to the strategy and, and policies that we want to put in place, we allow some flexibility in there that if the data comes back and says things are going to get worse than we expected, you know, based on what we set out, that we can adjust accordingly without having to resubmit to the town, you know, or approval. I'm not sure how you get around that resubmit. Huh. Uh, not every town um, um, tries to get uh, certified by the state. Of course, it's kind of self-defeating if you don't. But um. right, right. So you in matter of fact, well, we started off in two thousand and six when they put the, the the new group together, and that was one of the mandates: was don't worry about getting the state approval; just get this passed by the town. Yeah. Um, but along the way, we worked hard to make sure we get passed by the state as well because we knew the value of it. That's the track we're on right now. But the question then: um, say in five years. You want to make a modification to one part of the plan, but you don't want to go to the state. Like, you don't have to. Yeah, true. Well, I was just thinking maybe a way we could write those strategies and policies that gives us a little bit of flexibility to adjust, maybe. Yeah, in terms of climate, your timing actually turned out to be fortuitous because the, uh, the uh, Maine Climate Council released their um, big report in December. Hmm. So that's right. a milestone. So they're, uh, we're, we're, we're on track to, to yeah. in sync with a major piece of, um, you know, what the state of Maine is up to. Okay. Okay. So maybe it won't be an issue then. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was, I was just going to say that it, even though uh, this is a hard document and it's, you know, it's going to be tied with a bow. There's no reason why we really couldn't keep sort of a, an ongoing uh, folder or folio of notes and comments as we mm. move forward because it's it would be the same group still discussing things. And as issues come up, we would have that ability to talk it over and at least keep a record and have yeah. a record that we could have as a... Not as, not as an attachment, but an ongoing record of the comp plan. I mean, that's it's great because our notes would lead us to the next one right. as well. Right. I mean, it may not be in this package, but I think that 
comments as we move forward on specific aspects of the plan can be written down and discussed and, and, and noted. Yeah. Right? Well, not yeah. only that, but you can actually put out polls to the community yeah. if there are subjects that warrant it. And even though it's not timely for until the next edition, right? Uh, you still have that documented. And yeah, yeah, and the document is there, but life goes on. And you're moving forward towards, you know, you're, you're living in a flexible, thinking in a yeah. flexible way yeah. about the issues that may have been true in 2022, but in 2025 may be right. slightly different. Totally. Slightly yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah, and I just think we, we, we just as we write the strategies, let's see if there's ways yeah. that we can keep them yeah. a little fluid. <laughs> yeah, so that we can adjust and still be consistent with our plan. That's that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. You you can also we can also document the growth planning committee's interest in using the you know the best available information. Right. Um, and so that could Good. sort of spur um, oh reopening a conversation on. Um, that different topics if you know if you do have new information or data that um, or trends in the community that um, you know give you a good reason to relook at some of those strategies okay. where's that baby <laughs> There's just a cat bothering me right now. The baby's been screaming downstairs for the last hour and a half. Yeah. She's not so, walking. Is she? There's, there's okay. just a cat here. No, she's yeah. only three months, so she's yeah. not walking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she'll, she'll be walking at four. <laughs> she's very gifted, I'm sure. She'll be very early. Uh, she'll do everything early. I don't think she's going to crawl early, but. Maybe walk. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, good discussion. Um, so we finished. Any other comments on the winter winter public outreach part? Okay. No, in, you, that will probably go up online in the next week or two. Oh, uh, yeah, in the next, I would say, day or, day or two, we can get it up. Yep. Okay, That's excellent. Great. Get it up. Excellent. Okay. Um, Austin, next up, we'll oh, go ahead. Austin, you're looking. You guys, you know, I, I I track COVID every day and I'm trying to envision whether, you know, we'll 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 be safe. People will we'll perceive it to be safe to have like a uh, a public event associated with the comp plan, you know, to get input from the residents. Right. Well, now with Merck and, and uh, J and J partnering, they're talking about having everyone vaccinated by May. That was something I heard on the news an yeah. hour. I mean, there's yeah. a very, very hopeful, very yeah. kind of forward thinking, forward looking. Uh, yeah, I, I think President about, Biden said that mm -hmm. everybody get their first shot by the end of May. Right. So, And that Good. this third vaccine is only one shot anyway, so. Yeah, that one is, yep. So, so maybe there is an opportunity this coming summer to, you know, engage the, uh, the larger community. In person. Be nice. Yeah. Be nice to see you guys in person. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Be nice to see somebody. In person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway. All right. So uh, next up is uh, the minutes by Janet, February 16th. Any discussion on those? Move to accept. Okay. Take a second. Anyone second? Can I'll I second? Okay. I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any other any discussion? Here and none. All in favor? Aye. Everyone else? To adjourn? <laughs> no, no. If they were a couple of minutes. Except one those vote. minutes. <laughs> aye. 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 Good, good, good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. You're welcome. All right. So, and then last is next chapter will be hazard mitigation. 
Is that true? Yep. Okay. Then we'll have that for uh, the 16th of March, yes. 2021. Great. I just noticed that there. A minute said 2020. Oh, come uh, on. Did I really? No, 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 no. The agenda listed okay. as of uh, February, the 2020 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, any other, it's not on the topic, but any other business we need to discuss? Okay, so um, just the, on the agenda next time, we should uh, have a, a review of some information related to the growth area maps that we need to do uh, to provide any guidance on. So we'll, we'll need that on the agenda. Okay. Uh, we can put that after. Uh, we can cover your chapter first, and then we can have that discussion. We will, we will take care of that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now I'll take a motion. Mr. Fitzgerald. Seeing no <laughs> other business. Hearing no other business. Not being able to touch anyone. <laughs> I would say uh, I'll make a move motion to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> Second. If Warner yeah. will make sure that he has his ears lit every every uh, time we have a meeting. Yeah, I, I thought that's that, like, cool. he was going to land the plane. Yeah. yeah. I, I put these on just for you, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what's all making right. all the noise? <laughs> no, no, no noise. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I hear a harmonica in the background. Okay. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Hi. Hi. All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Rock. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.